I go even further. You good? Cool. <laughs> if you need a title for this message, it's a simple title. It's called Take a Risk. All right? Take a Risk. As we get into this word, I invite you to join me in the word of prayer. Pray with me. Oh, God, we come to this time where we come to hear from you. I am just a vessel willing to be used so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, God, open our ears, open our eyes. Let us receive what you have in store for us in this word. Let us dive into this parable and you speak to us how we need to sometimes need to step out and take a risk so we can be able to be used mightily and fully and use the gifts and talents that you poured within us so that we can be a blessing and show your work in this world. Have your way in this time. In Jesus' name we do pray. And the people of God say, amen. So, just a little background about me, because if you have not known, before me becoming a pastor, I was working in the education system. So, do I have any fellow educators here with me? Anybody fellow educators? Yeah, yeah, I'm not alone. Cool. So, when it comes to education system, you know, we love the kids. We love everybody. And sometimes I'm like, God, get your people, because sometimes you want to knock some of these kids out of the head. But <laughs> you love them. You love them. But one of the things is that before being a pastor, though, with my background, so, you know, education-wise, I got a bachelor's in youth studies, minor in African, African-American studies, and a master's in education in youth development and leadership, all from the University of Minnesota, Sky Yuma, all day, every day. But when it comes to be working in education, I work through different nonprofits. And when it comes to working with the youth, there was one quote that I saw in the teacher's classroom, and it resonated with me. And some of the youth that I worked with looked at me and was like, why do you keep telling us this quote? But it had a lot of depth into it. The quote said this, don't decide you can't before you discover that you can. I'll say it again. Don't decide you can't before you discover that you can. When I heard that quote, it sounded simple, but I also wonder what kind of difference we can make if we actually took the risk to just try, okay? So to go into the scripture, we are back in the Gospel of Matthew. We have fun being Matthew in 2023 from January to May. But to recap, this gospel is written by the Apostle Matthew, also known as Levi, who was a tax collector. And the goal into this book of the Gospel of Matthew is that Matthew wants to prove to the Jews and to everybody that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the one spoken of by the prophets. And we find ourselves here in Matthew 25, where Jesus is in Jerusalem, and Jesus has tension with the religious leaders. Not a surprise. But they had tension when it comes to the source of his authority. But the verses earlier, there was a parable about the ten bridesmaids and how Jesus is calling us to get ready for his return. We rely on that theme about Jesus with his return. We go more in depth with that. And we're dealing with some things when it comes to the end times, the study of the judgment. If you want a seminarian word, it is eschatology. But right here in this parable, we see that Jesus gives a story of a man who is about to take a journey and has three servants. The man not only entrusted these three servants with all his possessions, but also gave a different number of talents to each of these servants. Now, to understand what a talent is, I looked at different biblical commentaries. A talent is basically a, it's like a currency that has some weight to it. It was a sum of money. And each of these people had their own different parts of talents. And a talent can be either gold or silver. So to break it down, the talents, I'm going to break it down so you can understand the weight and how much it costs if the talent was gold or silver because in the text we don't get that indication if it was gold or silver. So the person who had five talents, okay, five talents in gold weighs 374 pounds. That is equivalent to... $11 million. If we took that five talents in silver, same amount of weight, 
but it's equivalent to $129,549. If we look at the servant with two talents, two talents in gold and silver weighs 149.60 pounds. And gold is $4 million. And silver is $51,820. Now, if we go to the servant with one talent, just one single talent, a single talent alone in gold or silver is 74.8 pounds. One talent in gold is worth $2 million. One talent in silver is worth $25,910. I got all these calculations from a calculator because I didn't have no time to try to do all that conversion. But in other words, the person who left on this journey had money. And he gave the service talents according to each of their ability because the master already knew the gifts and the abilities that each of these servants had. And so, while they were out, they went out, he enjoyed his journey, and the servants knew what they needed to do. If I had to bring it in other words, it's kind of like a way in which the servant gave all these servants these talents. It's like another way in which a teacher, if they needed to take a time off, would entrust that the school and the substitute teacher knows exactly what to do with their classroom to make sure that when they come back, it is not a hot mess. It's like me, as a pastor, if I have to go out, I can trust that everything will run smoothly, and I don't worry about no call, no email, no fire in the building. Or... But as, these, as, the, as the master went on and enjoyed his journey, the servant, the two servants, the one who had five talents, the one who had two talents, took the time to invest with those talents, and they doubled. But we learn about one servant who just had one talent and decided to do something different. Instead of going out and investing and using the gifts and abilities that they had to help make that talent go double, they decided to dig up a hole in the words of Disney, dig it up, uh, uh. Oh, wake up in the morning and before the sun, keep digging that hole till the day is done. Dig the hole, bury the talent, and just left it hanging. Thinking that we're going to be okay. Nobody's going to know. The master's going to not be mad at me. The master's going to be cool with it. So the master came. The servants got word. They came in front of the master. And the master was ready to do settle accounts with all the talents they entrusted. The first two shared how they doubled, and the master was joyous invited them to celebrate, and also gave them more responsibility. But we got the servant who had one single talent. And mind you, this master was already on a joy, was having a high, was having a good time. And here come a servant who's about to kill the vibes. And the servant come over here and just first, I like to see in verse 24, I like to say that this servant decided to first, before I tell my master the truth, let me sweet talk him. Boston, let me, tell him, let me tell him a little bit about himself. By saying, I knew you to be a harsh and demanding man. I don't know if that was a good way to introduce yourself for that. Afterwards, he said, I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look. Here's what you owe. Hmm. The servant with one talent thought he did his master a favor. And before the servant spoke, it was cool in the game. Celebrate good times. Come on. Boom, 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 boom. It's a celebration. It went from being cool in the game, celebration, good time, to the words of LL Cool J. I'm going to knock you out. Hey, mama said knock you out. Hey. Why I say that? Because I know the master was like, yeah, I'm going to knock you out because mama said knock you out. I did not tell you to bury my talent. I told you to invest. What were you thinking, you wicked and lazy servant? What are you doing? The master was disappointed. The master was not happy. And instead, the master took that servant and told him to go out of darkness, and took that one talent that he had and gave it to the person who had the most talents. Now, 
it's a lot in there. But also, it gave me some insights and something that we can take away from this passage. Here are a few points that I feel like we can take away from this passage. The first is this. Unleash your God-given potential. Unleash your God-given potential. Because just as the master in the parable knew his servants' capabilities and entrusted them with talent accordingly, God recognized each of our own unique abilities and entrusts us with the potential to make a meaningful impact. What's sad is when sometimes we don't activate and use our talents. Sometimes we sleep on them. Sometimes we suppress them. And sometimes we suppress our talents to help elevate someone else, make sure that they are successful while making sure ours stays on the ground. Sometimes out of fear. Sometimes out of comparison. When I reflect on my own journey, I was part of the Josie R. Johnson Leadership Academy with the African American Leadership Forum. If you don't know who Josie R. Johnson is, Josie R. Johnson is known as the first lady of the Minnesota Civil Rights Movement. She had done a lot. She used to be, she was like one of the first black regents at the University of Minnesota. And one of the things is that from this academy, what I appreciate is that it helped me really learn, learn about the asset of my heritage of being black. Because one of the questions that it asked, they asked me in the application, which resonated to me, was how do you see your blackness as an asset to your leadership? I was like, hmm, that is a good question. Because I grew up always trying to see that my blackness was a deficit. But instead, how do you see your culture and your heritage as an asset to your leadership and an asset to who you are? Because you shouldn't have to assimilate or, di- or suppress who you are. You should use that as a way to help fuel you so you could be authentically you and lead with authentic character and genuine compassion. And we, one of the things that we had was a professional coach. And my professional coach, his name was Dr. Freddie. And I swear that him and God was either had a speed, like they had some kind of meeting about me. They had some kind of thing to talk about me because I did not agree for him to come at my life, okay? What I mean by co- coming at my life is that every time me and him had our coaching sessions, I either leave out of there with some tears in my eyes or I'm just like, okay, I can't, I'm just like, "Mm." I can't, "Mm." that's all I can say. Y'all know words because he hit to the core of who I am. But he really helped me understand that I got a lot of gifts and talents and I got to see the greatness that God poured inside of me because a lot of times I could be my own worst enemy. And when we need to unleash our God gift of potential, we need to learn how to speak life within ourselves. But not only that, but we need to understand that all our gifts and talents are here to make a difference within the community and around the world, and God wants us to unleash it. God don't want us to hold it in. It is meant to be shared. So I encourage us to take that time to unlock, to unleash our God-given potential. But not only that, the other point that I see in here and we can learn this from the first servant, is this. Well, not only unleash your God-given potential, but we need to take a risk. In other words, try. Take a risk. Try. Because let's be honest. By a show of hands, and you can feel comfortable if you want to raise your hand, no pressure. How many of us like to take risks? How many of us is like, I like to play it safe? How many of us like, I don't care? <laughs> okay, let me see on Zoom. Zoom family, how many of y'all like to take risks by a show of hands? Any of y'all? Okay, any of y'all like to play it safe? Some of y'all are like, eh, eh, eh. Okay, cool. I'm not alone. I'm in the right church. That's awesome. But let me, let's, we got to understand that in life, we got to sometimes take risks because sometimes when we play it safe, we can sometimes be missing an opportunity, and sometimes we can even miss out on our blessings. Because when I reflect on my time in education, I used to work with this nonprofit known as the Sonic Foundation. And the Sonic Foundation, I was part of the flagship program known as Dreamline, in which we go inside the schools, and we are the bridge between the teacher and the student. 
And one of my favorite classes I love to help out in was math. Now, math is my favorite subject. I love messing with numbers. I love all the equations and anything. Holla at your boy. But I had a student who consistently never fails me when after the teacher explains and breaks it down, will come straight to me and be like, I need help. I don't understand. And my question is, did you try? Their response, no. My response back, I need you to try. Because how am I supposed to help you out and give you wisdom if you don't take the opportunity to try? I need you to make that mistake so I know where I can help you at. And sometimes in our mistakes is where the wisdom can lie. And sometimes we really need to just step out, take that risk, and just try. And, I understand, and trust, you ain't going to get hurt a lot of times. But I know it can be scary. But God wants us to take that leap of faith. Because I can go in Scripture where it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 verse 6. Because one thing about faith is that you got to trust that God's going to work it out. But also, when you try something out in life, when you have the faith, you're like, I'm going to try it. I know it's not going to require perfection, but I'm just going to do the best that I can in order to see where I can go from here. We should sometimes let our faith guide us to try, to risk, and to trust that God will use our efforts, and perfect as they are, for a perfect purpose. Which brings me to my last point. So yes, we need to unleash the potential that we have inside of us. Yes, we need to sometimes take that risk and just try. But understand, the third point is that there's an eternal return. There's an eternal return. Because one of the things that Jesus brings into this parable is the spiritual principle. Faithfulness in small things leads to responsibility over greater things. Faithfulness in just small things, as even Jesus told us to have a faith as small as a mustard seed, can lead to responsibility and lead to, th- or lead to greater things. Because the servants who actively invested their talents represent those who understand the value of what God has entrusted to them. Because they do not merely hold on to these gifts. They put them to work. They bring active engagement. And the principle to everyone who has more and more will be given is not merely about material abundance, but speaks to a deeper spiritual truth that it's about the principle of an increase that comes from engagement and participation in the work of God. And when we have invested what we have been given, our time, our talents, our treasures, even for God's purposes, you see it multiplies. And this multiplication It's not just for our own benefit. This multiplication is for the benefit of others. And the currency in this context is not not only just physical money, but spiritual wealth, faithfulness, obedience, and service. Because understand, this is just not a story about ancient servants. This story is also about us, us who are here in the here and now. Because how can we multiply what we have been given for God's glory. Because, as an example, let's take the instance of listening. Listening seems like a seemingly small talent, but when we truly actively listen and invest in this wisely, it can have truly profound effects. Because the saying goes, there's a difference between listening and hearing. Because when you truly actively listen, you bring your full aspect of who you are to that person. When you're just hearing, you're just going by the byways and highways. It goes in one ear and out the other, and you're not truly being active. Because listening is an active way. We have to be active in our listening. But one of the things is that when it comes to all the things, when it comes to the eternal return, God is calling us to truly act and understand that everything that we do will come back and invest in us. When we are faithful, 
it will grow beyond measure. So as I close, we are about to enter into a season of Thanksgiving. And let me be honest, Thanksgiving, its origin story, not the best. I'm going to acknowledge that. Because for some indigenous communities, this is not a beautiful holiday. This is a holiday that's more of harm, marked by colonization, marked with genocide, marked with a, not a beautiful history. I want to acknowledge and speak that. But I also want to acknowledge this. In the midst of this, what Thanksgiving also brings for us is a time for us to be thinking about the ways in which we can be thankful. Sometimes the days when we need to be gra show gratitude because this time of year, it causes us to be in celebration of the harvest. In fields across the land, farmers reap what they have sown. Gathering the bounty the earth has yielded. And isn't it the same with the talents that God has entrusted to each of us? As we reflect on the physical abundance we enjoy, let's also consider the spiritual harvest we are gathering from the seeds of potential that God has planted within our souls. What crops of character and service are we cultivating? with the talents we have been given? What crops of character and service are we cultivating with the talents we have been given? I pray that this Thanksgiving season, we look beyond the banquet table and ponder the feast of growth and opportunity that lies before us. Because how are we nurturing these divine seeds to bear fruit in our lives and the lives of others? Let the spirit of the season truly move us to not only give thanks for what we have received, but to sow and invest in ways that will bring forth a harvest of righteousness and a joy in the kingdom of God. Let us come into the season, and let us, even as we get prepared to enter the 2024, take that time to take a step, to take a risk, and trust that God got us so that we can unleash the full potential that we have. And when we try, we can reap the eternal rewards from it. Amen? Let us pray. Oh, God, each and every single person, and not only in-house, each and every single person virtually, every single person around this world, you have given us each a gift and talent to make a difference in this world. And sometimes, God, we sleep on it. Sometimes, God, we suppress it. Sometimes, God, we don't even know what it is. God, I pray that you help us unlock the gifts and talents that we have. God, if we have been harmed and shut down from using our gifts and talents, I pray that you open the door for us to take that time to heal and to be able to nurture those, nurture those talents, to resurrect those talents back in us. Because at the end of the day, God, all the gifts and talents it's showing us not an aspect of your character, but showing us the diversity of the kingdom, showing us diversity of creation, and for us to make a difference within each other's lives. God, let this message, let this message resonate with us as we enter into this Thanksgiving season, as we get ready to go into 2024, as you're trying to unlock the new thing in our lives, as we should continue to hold on to your hand, as we keep our eyes focused on you, Jesus, and as we continue to put our trust in you. Because, God, whenever we are weak, you are our strength. Let us continue to hold on to you and continue to guide us along the way. Thank you, God, for all you do. Thank you for the blessing you have been to us. And thank you for using us and pouring these gifts and talents in us to make a difference in this world and this thing we call life. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we